Hello, everybody. Brian King here. Welcome to another fun-filled Facebook Live. I hope you really enjoyed the video that I did yesterday. And this might be another intensive because I want to make sure that I'm as comprehensive as possible in giving you strategies so that you can have the best possible results. So with that, let's jump right in into my series on communication strategies. And the one I'm going to start off with today is what I consider to be the number one king of the hill or queen top of the line strategy that everybody, whether they're on the spectrum or off, need to master, okay? And that number one strategy for effective communication is the fine art of clarification. Now, people think they know what clarification is, but I guarantee you people are blowing it, which is why I think it is so essential. So please pay attention to all the details here. And like a lot of my strategies, there's more art than science, but you can learn to customize this to your own situation. So just stay tuned and we'll explain how to do that. Now, in my experience, every community, pardon, every communication strategy you'll ever use is rooted in clarification as the foundation. Now, I know some of you are probably thinking, well, I knew that. I already do clarification. It's common sense. Well, guess what? You may know it, but hardly anybody does it. And they hardly ever do it the way I've learned to do it, okay? The people I've met, and I've met hundreds, if not thousands over the years, understand clarification mentally. They get it as a concept, but they haven't learned it as a concrete, conscious deliberate strategy, and that makes a big difference. So if you say that you clarify all the time, well, maybe you clarify some of the time, but I guarantee you that you do not clarify as often as you need to, and you don't do it the same way. So for instance, have you ever experienced, and I'm this is a rhetorical question, have you ever experienced misunderstandings, arguments, misconceptions in any of the relationships you had? That's an easy yes, right? So how often after a misunderstanding do you say to yourself, oh, well, next time I'll remember to ask or check in with you. Uh, next time I'll remember to clarify, but then you don't. That's typically what people do. This is because you haven't learned to believe that clarification is critical, a priority, or essential to your relationships. That's why you don't do it. In my life, I miss so much nonverbal information that I better clarify so that I have enough information to know what the heck is going on. And by doing so, my life has become so much easier. Because if those of you who are unfamiliar with me, I have ADHD, dyslexia, and depending on who you ask, some twinges of Asperger's. So I miss a lot of the nonverbal communication that's going on. Now, my senses are out of sync, so I spend more time focusing on what I'm hearing as opposed to what I'm seeing. So if I don't hear it, you might as well pretend it didn't get communicated. However, I cannot hold others responsible for the fact that I miss nonverbal cues. So I've got to learn strategies to make sure I get what I need. And that is exactly what this lesson is designed to teach you. Now, let's define clarification so we understand it in the same way. Clarification is checking in with the person you're communicating with in order to verify the message you received is the message the other person intended, which means you want to make sure that the meaning you're assigning to that person's words is the meaning they meant. I have gotten in arguments over the years with some People will call them spectrumites. You know, that's a, a term that one of my mentors came up with to refer to people on the Asperger spectrum or on the ADHD spectrum. So I'll just use that word spectrumites. It's like if I was saying, this is for women, this is for lawyers. I'm not using the word to other them or label them, okay? If I call somebody a lawyer, I'm not labeling them. I'm simply using a word to help you get a sense of what population, what community I'm speaking to. Good? Okay. So 
a lot of the spectrumites that I've talked to have stubbornly insisted that the dictionary meaning of the word must be the same meaning you assign to it. That is wrong. A lot of the language we use, the meaning we assign to it, is mm -hmm. something that we learn through our conversations with other people. We learn how people use certain words, what they mean when they use certain words. And we can adopt those words and meanings through social interaction, not because we carry an underbridged dictionary around us everywhere to make sure that our meaning agrees with the dictionary. Okay? Just keeping that in mind. Now, of course, you remember to do clarification some of the time, like I've been saying. But what I'm suggesting is that you do it as a habit and not on occasion when you happen to remember to do it. There is one obvious problem with this strategy, though, and it's that people generally resist clarifying. They resist checking in with each other. Has this been your experience as well? You know, you're afraid to clarify? When you've attempted to clarify, have you received responses such as this? You should have been paying attention. I don't like repeating myself. You should have listened the first time. Well, if you get garbage like that, no wonder you're afraid to clarify. And if you have ever responded in this way, then you understand that what you've done, and please listen to this, what you've done is criticize or punish someone for clarifying with you. Spend some time and let that sink in, how you're sabotaging your own ability to be heard, okay? And as parents, and I see this so often, the parents, they say to their kids, I don't like repeating myself. You hear that a lot in the, the schools as well. In fact, you hear it a lot at home. Anything that responds defensively when someone tries to clarify with you, you've got to reflect upon that and get it out of your thinking. And we'll address that as well. When someone gives you an opportunity to be better understood by clarifying and you become defensive, what happens? What do they learn about clarifying? They learn not to do it. That it's dangerous because it makes you angry. And because clarification is so critical to communication, I made a point of asking people on the spectrum as well as typical folks your average folks. I asked them, why did they resist clarifying? And here's what I learned. The first reason is that people are generally overconfident in their own perception. They think they got it right the first time, that they have this unique ability to immaculately take in language and know immediately what it means. You know folks like that? Have you ever been like that? Another thing to keep in mind, but guess what? Those people still have a lot of miscommunication, misunderstandings, because they do not question their own perception. Now, even though they're proven incorrect time and time again, it doesn't occur to them to do anything different. There is even a word that describes the habit of thinking, you got it right, don't need to clarify, and believe that you have enough information without it. And that word is assumption. People rely more on assumption than clarification, even though it's incredibly unreliable. It's unreliable because assumption requires mind reading. It's guessing about what somebody's thinking, about what somebody means. And there's no information gathering in assumption. Assumption is the false belief that communication has taken place, but without any proof. You're relying solely on your belief and your immaculate perception to fill in the gaps of what information you're better off getting by asking. And this is dangerous in a relationship, and yet we all do it. I've done it, and I continue to work diligently to do it less and less. Now, people assume that they know what the other person meant, how the other person feels, and worst of all, they believe they know what the other person is thinking. Assuming you know what's going on in someone's internal life is the most absurd assumption. And there are classes that, you know, 
they can be social skills groups or they can be psychology classes, whatever, that talk about perspective taking and the importance of knowing what another person might be thinking. That is nonsense. You don't want to teach people to guess or assume. Learn to diplomatically ask what the other person is thinking. That's the solution, and that's what I'm going to be teaching you today. Don't read a person's mind. Ask him or her a question and clarify. Assumption causes communication problems, and it never solves them. Have you ever assumed things while communicating? And if so, what were the results of you assuming? Has it ever gone well? And sometimes you're lucky. You, know, you might be right on occasion. You might be working with somebody that you know very well, who is very predictable, very anal, and very easy to read. You know, you can set your watch by this person. Being able to read some people so well can lull you into a false sense of security in your assumptions. Now, think about the other person who assumes that you understood him. When there's a misunderstanding, they blame you as though the understanding was solely your responsibility. That ever happened? Somebody who expects you to read their mind? The problem was in the assumption and the fact that clarification didn't take place. Wouldn't it make more sense to clarify and make sure you understood him and for him to make sure he under was understood by you? So you both have the responsibility to clarify. Ask the questions, get the clarification, and you'll not have to worry about it. Let me get a quick sip of water here. Now, let's talk about nonverbal communication, because this is my Achilles heel. I've repeatedly read a statistic that states nonverbal communication accounts for well over 85% of communication. If that is correct, then especially the spectrumites, folks like me and maybe like you, are in big trouble. And the reason why that is, is because it means we're not talking to each other. We're relying more on mind reading than we are. Now, let me just clarify for a moment. The intention of the way we're wired for communication is for our brains to take in a combination of what we're seeing, nonverbal communication, and what we're hearing through the language. And we're supposed to combine that into a complete conversation. That's supposed to be the entire picture of somebody's communication. But when you have a glitchy brain that has gaps in it, 85% is a no-go. We simply don't function like that. I lean so much more. I'm, I'm not going to randomly choose a percentage here. But I lean so much more towards auditory that I really give minimal attention to nonverbal. So let's keep going, and I'll talk about how you compensate for that. I personally don't believe that over 85% of communication must be nonverbal. Now, I believe it's our bodies communicating what we're afraid to talk about or don't know how to talk about. You know, you have all these people that form a, a career over telling when someone's lying, you know, when their words are incongruent with their body. And this is why a lot of folks on the spectrum can also be gullible because they're listening to the language and they're taking somebody at their word. They're hearing it literally and they're looking for signs that things might be off. That's one of the reasons I take somebody with me when I go buy a car and stuff, because not only do people talk too fast, but I miss the nonverbal. So I bring somebody with me to catch that stuff and it has helped me tremendously. So what we really need to do here is Increase the percentage that we're communicating verbally and invite the other person that we're talking to to do that as well. But we need to invite them to do it safely so they're not afraid to clarify with us. Okay. Again, how reliable is nonverbal communication in the first place? We all need to learn to remember that nonverbal communication is unreliable. Even that needs to be clarified. It does not tell you what a person is thinking. 
it may give you some hints that you base those wonderful assumptions on, but it doesn't tell you the whole story. Now, with my brain, nonverbal communication looks like a little dance people are doing in addition to their words. You know, it doesn't really mean much to me. I'm getting better at it though. So if there's more I need to know from a person, I'd better ask. Is there more I need to know that you haven't told me? That's what I use a lot with people. You know, is there more that I need to know about that? It gives them time to reflect a little bit and see if there's something that they haven't said. And though I could easily assume it, you know, oh, well, he's told me everything. If it was important, he would have told me. Not necessarily. If I assume that, I can walk away and have a huge misunderstanding and then blame him for not being clear enough in the first place. Communication takes two. That's why you ask questions to get the information that you need. So bottom line is overestimating your own perception and assuming is one reason people don't clarify. But there's a bigger reason why people don't clarify. And what I've learned from everybody I've talked to over the years, people on the spectrum, people not on the spectrum, and also reflecting upon my own experience, is that they do not clarify because they are afraid the other person will be angry with them. Does that sound right to you? I mean, I know I'm not really in the market to be chewed out today, and I don't imagine that you care for it either. Sometimes you're afraid of asking the wrong questions. You don't want to offend anyone. You don't want to sound too pushy. You don't want to sound rude. And of course, you absolutely don't want somebody to be angry with you. And people are so afraid of this, in fact, that they would rather risk miscommunication and misunderstanding just to avoid anger. The reality is that all you really accomplish by not clarifying is you postpone the anger. You know, they get angry at you now because how dare you not listen to me because every word I utter is gold. Or you put it off till later, then they're mad at you because there was a misunderstanding. And how could you assume that? You can ask now or ask later. Does this make sense? Now, you may think doing things this way makes people look pretty stupid if you clarify a lot. I wouldn't say stupid. I'd say unaware. People aren't paying attention to how they communicate, what's working, what isn't. What's worse is that the one strategy, clarification, is something we're taught from childhood to avoid doing. We learned that it's the worst thing we can do is make somebody else angry, right? And as a parent, I admit, I was guilty of this too at one point. You know, your children do things to push your buttons and you react by saying, don't make me angry. You know that makes me mad. It's the ultimate warning we give our kids. What happens here is we are teaching our children that our anger is their responsibility. You make me angry. So it's their responsibility to not make us angry, even if it's at the expense of clarification. I really want you to spend some time thinking about that. It is so critical. Another thing that interferes with clarification is a real common difference between people that are on the spectrum and people that are not. Now, you may be familiar with a tendency in some people to prioritize feelings over facts. They're more interested in how you feel. Would you say that's accurate? And this is where the anger issue comes into it. Well, I want you to feel good. I want you to be happy with me. So I will tell you what I need to tell you so you feel good because I don't want you to be angry. This is how we train people to tell us what we want to hear instead of telling us the honest truth. Do you realize that a lot of lying is all about avoiding or delaying anger from somebody? People cover the truth. They, they offer compliments that they don't mean in order to protect the other person and themselves from feeling anger. In other words, feeling good is at the expense of effective communication. Are you getting this? It doesn't make sense to communicate that way, especially 
when you are somebody that has a glitchy brain, you have Asperger's, you have ADHD or dyslexia, it makes more sense for us to use facts. I've also experienced that anger and I've experienced that anger can turn an otherwise honest person into a liar because they feel so beaten up, they want to just avoid it. That becomes the priority. Now, there's a stereotype out there that, well, people with autism or people with Asperger's are so honest, they don't lie. Well, guess what? If you are honest, you tend to be honest until you are yelled at and criticized often enough for being honest that you expect anger in a response to your honesty. And then you begin to protect yourself. So a lot of these kids who are lying and deceiving, when I explore with them, you know, when I'm coaching them, the reasons that they say they're lying, well, mom always yells at me, or I always get in trouble, or I'm tired of the hassle. So they either start lying or they shut down, they say, I don't know. They find ways to avoid that engagement because they're afraid of anger and criticism. You know, they've learned honesty doesn't bring me support. So if you don't want your child to lie, don't give him a reason to. Don't punish honesty with anger and make it dangerous, okay? My oldest son, who is 18 now, is one of the most truthful people on the planet, even to this day. He could not keep a secret to save his life. My middle son, who is now 14, he's had more of a challenge when it comes to, to criticism, that he began lying about everything. He's much better now, but he's still working on it. It was so extreme when he was younger that if you ask him if he wanted a particular food, he'd say yes, even though he didn't want it because he thought it would make us happy. Then when we would give him the food, he wouldn't eat it, which of course caused more problems. And what I finally figured out what was going on with him, I began working on my own responses as well as helping him understand his own needs and showing more obvious respect for them. It's becoming now far easier for him to be truthful because I helped him understand that if he's honest with me, he will get support and understanding instead of anger. Now, here's our predicament. What do you do when you value clarification, but the person you want to clarify with gets angry or defensive? How do you talk to that person? Because I know this is probably the biggest concern in your mind right now. So let me tell you what to do. You could simply stop talking to this person or lie, but it won't change anything. So let me teach you the key to solving that problem of how to bring clarification into the communication and getting rid of the habit of reacting with anger. This is how you do it. You negotiate clarification into that relationship or into that moment. You explain the need for it, the problems it solves, and agree to clarify with each other in order to increase understanding in your relationship. I'll get into that more in detail. Don't worry. A mother asked me how to clarify nonverbal cues. She pointed out that nonverbal cues can be misinterpreted in a negative way and people can become upset about it. You know, oh, what does that look supposed to mean? You no know, stuff like that. Now, if you become angry, it's because of an assumption that you knew what the cue meant. You know, what is that face? Or, or what is that supposed to mean? You know, whatever gesture you're reading as being an indication of their thoughts or their feelings. The solution to avoid this kind of upset is to check in with the person and see if what they did meant something. And this is how you clarify, okay? I noticed you did whatever the gesture was after I said whatever you said, and I'm not sure how you took it. So could you please tell me what you think I meant? Did you get that? I noticed that you did gesture after I said, statement. I'm not sure how you took it. Could you please tell me what you think I meant? This is how you get them to take a nonverbal cue and make it verbal. Okay. I have used this a lot, very, very effectively. The same mother explained that typical people 
are taught to hide nonverbal behaviors that are easier to read in children who haven't learned to hide them yet. You know, the kids, they're like a pane of glass you can see right through. And she said, you can watch your children and know when they're happy or sad or when they're excited or when they're lying. Well, then you have children with ADHD or Asperger's or something like that, and they are very animated. And you can really, you know, typically tell how they're feeling. But then as we become adults, we lose a lot of that authenticity. We don't put ourselves all out there like we did when we were kids. So as adults, it can be very hard to read a person's cues if he's good at masking them. So I responded to her assessment by saying, something you just said is very interesting. You watch what your children are doing and you know how they're feeling. That is an assumption. You may have some indications as to how they might feel, but the only way you know what their experience is is to check in. And this is how you do it. It looks like you're happy, is that correct? Because some people have nervous laughter when they're uncomfortable. You know, I've worked with clients over the years that tell me, oh, my teenage daughter giggles at inappropriate times. You know, she, she giggles at a funeral. Or if somebody's sad, she laughs, things like that. That is not an indication into how somebody's feeling. Because laughter doesn't always mean happy. You know, it could be nervous. It could be fear. And if you keep... If you start punishing the, the laughter, that's inappropriate, don't do that. You're not helping your child connect with their feelings so that they can learn to express it in a more effective way. So even when you say, hey, you look happy, is that correct? You are giving a child language to an experience in the moment that they may otherwise be disconnected from. You're teaching them some emotional intelligence just with those observations. Now, here's where it gets really confusing for the child. The laughing parent, and I mentioned this a bit ago, the laughing parent suddenly gets angry and tells the child to stop it. So now the child wonders why you were happy one second and angry the next. The fact is you weren't happy, but the child didn't know that. The nervous laughter needed to be explained to him as nervousness. Now, what's causing the nervousness? What are you anxious about? What can he do about it? help him figure out strategies instead of just telling him to stop it. The fact is, what appears happy, as I said, and I can't say it enough, it can be anxiety. And what appears as anger can actually be fear. So don't assume it, clarify it. Now, in order to be able to make clarification a priority in your relationships, you need to have a belief about a clarification that makes it a priority. Now, by belief, I don't simply mean the thinking that mm, clarification is a good idea. A belief is something you feel in your gut. And when you don't do what you believe, you feel extremely uncomfortable. And if it's simply a good idea, ah, you may forget about it and not even notice. But when you go against a belief, you know it. See the difference? Now, the belief that reinforces valuing clarification, making it a priority in your life, is this. I must be certain I know what a person is thinking or feeling. And the only way to be certain is by asking. That's the belief that really nails this into your nervous system. Now, certainty is not achievable with assumption, because assumption, again, is guessing. So when you must be certain, and you trust nothing else but asking, you will be compelled to ask. You understand that your perception is imperfect and that the only way you will know is to clarify. With this belief, when you see someone who appears happy, you'll realize, well, maybe she's actually happy, but you don't know and you won't be sure until you clarify. So you have a belief that says, I don't have enough information until I ask. And if I haven't asked, I don't know. I'm just assuming. I'm guessing, and some people unfortunately mistake guessing and assumption for knowledge, because again, they put too much confidence in it. 
And that's where misunderstanding occurs. Do you always have to ask how a person is feeling or thinking? The answer is you don't always have to ask, but make sure that if you choose not to, that what you perceive is an assumption and it's not a fact until you clarify. Make sense? Don't make the mistake of deciding something without the clarification that gives you enough information to decide. All right? Now, here's an interesting problem. How do you teach the value of clarification to somebody on the spectrum that takes everything literally? You know, these are folks that think they have immaculate perception and they heard you correctly, the dictionary agrees, and that's what you meant. This is what I call and I've mentioned it a couple times, it's a fun term, immaculate perception. You know, the belief that your perception is spotless. And unfortunately, it can be the default setting for many people on the spectrum to take things literally, which is all the more reason for us to clarify. I fortunately, I used to be a real literal thinker and it created a lot of problems, but I've learned to take my tendency for literal thinking and use it to enhance my sense of humor. And that's a wonderful way that I've shifted it because my brain still does it. It still hears things literally, but I've learned so much over the years to distrust it and to clarify, okay? Oh, I, and this is a, an important note. I've also learned that if something that was said by somebody else upsets me, the first thing I must do is clarify because when I do, I give the person a chance to say it differently. I then hear it differently, and now my feelings change for the better. Because, you know, not everybody chooses their words perfectly the first time. Sometimes we get it wrong. It doesn't mean the first thing was a Freudian slip or what they actually meant. Sometimes it's just a bad choice of words, and they deserve a do-over, okay? Now, what if the literal thinker doesn't have the awareness that he or she is thinking literally? She thinks she's right and knows exactly what you meant and what you're thinking. So due to this extreme subjectivity and rigidity, she may think her thoughts are everyone else's thoughts. You know, she'll, she might think, well, you must be thinking it too. I'm sure everybody agrees with me. If anybody else heard this, they'd think what I think. So here's how you can introduce clarification into your relationship with a literal thinker. You say this, I heard you say that you think you know what I'm thinking. Well, the fact is, I don't know what you're thinking. When I say something to you, I don't know how you're going to respond. So I don't always choose the perfect words. I choose the words that I can think of. Then I need you to tell me what you think I meant so I can give you more words to explain what I really meant until I've used enough words for us to understand each other. Now this is being recorded, that was a lot, but you can go back and listen to it. The people in my membership program are gonna get a full transcript of this. So listen to the language and capture the spirit of the language. The spirit of the language is essentially saying, I can't read your mind. I need to get information to find out how you interpreted what I said. So you're teaching the person that their belief in mind reading is not shared by you. You acknowledge that you cannot read that person's mind and therefore you're gonna clarify. And yes, again, I know this sounds complex, but stick to the spirit of it and you should do pretty well. So hopefully that's helpful. I'm just looking through my notes here. Oh, one thing that I also need to clarify sometimes is whether somebody meant something literally or as an expression. You know, because there are some people that they deliver their humor with a very, they have a very dry sense of humor and everything is pretty monotone. And I'm never really sure, did you mean that? Or was that a joke? And some people know that I take things literally sometimes. And if I get a deer in the headlights look, they know to put their hand on my shoulder and say, I was joking. The object of social strategies, just in general, must not be to teach us to make our minds do things that they don't. You know, I'm a little put off by those facial expression charts that look more like emojis than somebody else's face. 
that really doesn't help us learn expressions. It also teaches us to stop listening, start looking, so you miss half of what's being communicated. Because a lot of spectrumites don't multitask their senses. They don't hear and watch at the same time. They do one or the other. And expecting them to do something that their brain simply isn't wired to do, it can be unreasonable and feel very disrespectful. So we need the awareness of how our minds work in a social situation, no matter who you are, whether you're typical and you have all of your faculties or whether you're on the spectrum and have more specialized ways of communicating. And the more information that we understand we miss, the more we know what information we need to get. So hopefully the rest of you can agree to meet us halfway because at the end of the day, we both want to be understood. We want to communicate but we need to figure out what works best for our relationship. And remember this phrase, we need to emphasize the product over the process. In other words, don't get hung up on, oh, well, you're supposed to do this in this situation, or you're supposed to do that, or you're supposed to move your hand that way. What matters is, do we understand each other? You may have to come up with some creative ways to do it, but as long as the product, understanding, connection took place, be more flexible in the process, okay? Now, I'm living proof, as are many of my clients, that this is achievable, teachable, and best of all, it's generalizable. You can use it with any relationship in any context. You know, regardless of what is considered appropriate, not one of my favorite words, and what other people are used to, Clarification can work with anybody in any situation, even when you don't know the rules of that situation. You know, because there are some places in public you're supposed to act a certain way and don't act another way. You know, there are different people, different scenarios, different protocols, and you can clarify by asking, and I've done this, okay? People invite me to hang out with a group of friends I've never met before. So I'll say, excuse me a second, how is this supposed to go? Or I'll ask, what is my role here? Hey, can you mind telling me, you know, you guys have hung out for a long time, I'm new. What are the rules? You know, what would you like me to do? You may be surprised at how well this works. Because your friend who has invited you wants you to be comfortable, wants to orient you. And maybe there's a certain guy who gets pissed off whenever you discuss politics. So if you ask, hey, what are the rules here? Are there certain subject matters I should stay away from? Your friend will educate you. You know, and you have to say, ah, man, don't worry about it. Just go with the flow. All right. Well, I don't go with the flow very well. Tell me what your experience is with these guys. I want to be supportive to them. I want to bring value to this. So just give me some pointers. Your friends will typically be very accommodating for you. There's even been times where I've said, you know, just full out disclosure. I'll say, you know, I kind of have lousy social skills in these situations, and I don't know what to do here. And there was one time I traveled to uh, to California to do a presentation. It was the first time I had an In-N-Out burger. And if you have not had an In-N-Out burger, you don't know what you're missing. They were totally awesome. So they had a different ordering process I wasn't used to. So I walked into the counter, and I said, excuse me, I've never done this before. What do I do? And their face lights up and they say, oh man, a first time, or yeah, well, this is how we work. People are very responsive to these things. You'd be surprised. Now, keep in mind that I've spent upwards of 20 years thinking this through. I'm passionate about communication and connection because for so much of my life, I positively sucked at it. And I was so afraid of being yelled at, having misunderstandings, being accused of being rude, that I really set out to master this thing called communication. And I think I've done pretty darn well. Now, there are people on the spectrum that frankly have given up on learning how to make communication work. Instead, they make excuses. They'll isolate themselves, play video games all day, and refuse to talk to other people. And they justify it by saying, well, I have autism. I don't get that social stuff. Or, you know, I'm too scattered. I I can't follow the conversation. And it's also fair to say that he or she doesn't know 
what he doesn't know. He just knows that socializing is confusing and it can be painful because you feel alone in a group. You really want to engage, but when you do, it blows up in your face. And as I mentioned earlier, people on the spectrum need to learn what the nonverbal frequency is communicating and how to get the information another way. In other words, they need to know that people tend to show their emotion through their nonverbal cues. They need to know what's being communicated through that channel. It's harder to teach them to actually see that channel. But it's important to know that it's out there, and if they don't see it, they need to get it a different way. It's like, you know there are radio signals flying through the air, can't see them, but you know they're there. You want to access them. What do you do? You get a radio and you tune in. The radio is a tool that allows you to access those waves differently than seeing them directly. Make sense? Okay. So the first step in helping a spectrumite who has reached this point of helplessness is to ask him to share what other people say and do that he finds confusing. You know, tell me a time where you had difficulty being misunderstood or understanding somebody else. Now, because you have to start the conversation and move his or her awareness from nothing works, I've tried everything to exactly what isn't working. What have you noticed that's gone wrong? Let's take these things one at a time, let's define it and find a strategy to solve it. That's what I've done with all my interactions. That's what I do with my clients and my own kids. And it works beautifully. So how do you know when you've clarified enough? You know you've clarified enough when both of you understand, this is important, what action you are going to take based on the conversation. So you'd say, based on what you just said, I'm hearing that you want me to do this. Is that correct? When the other person confirms your understanding of the action you'll take, then you have complete clarification. So the action might just be that I want you to know this. Okay, so let me get this straight. You're saying you want me to know this thing, is that correct? Yes, great. You want me to remember this thing? Okay, let me write it down. You want me to go and physically do something, is that correct? All right, when the action is agreed upon, you have clarification. Now, what's the best way to teach clarification to a youngster? Well, pretty straightforward, by modeling it. Don't explain it, don't lecture. When you're interacting with your child or with your husband or a wife that may be a little spectrum-y, you model it while you're communicating with that person. That's how you teach it. You make it part of the relationship, not part of a scolding or a lecture or anything like that. Ask questions and tell him why you're doing it. Why are you doing it this way? Why are you suddenly talking to me this way and asking me these questions? You say, I'm clarifying so that I can understand you better because that's a need they have. They want to be understood. I want to show you, and this is some key language, I want to show you the respect of making sure I understand you as much as possible. I want you to understand me as much as possible too, so we can feel good about talking with each other, not fearing anger, but feeling good about communicating. Explain the reason for clarifying and the critical piece, the problems being solved by clarifying, as opposed to the problems being avoided by lying, by assuming. The, the social skills approach would say, well, you say hi to someone when that person says hi because it's polite. That's very rote. You know, you do it because you're supposed to do it. It doesn't teach you what problem is being solved by doing that or what need is being met. It's important to put that very concrete emotional intelligence piece into this. You don't want things to be mechanical without meaning or belief behind it. Oh, I said hi because I'm supposed to say hi. There's a lot more to it than that. What problems does being a appropriate, not my favorite word, solve? Appropriateness solves the problem of people not criticizing you because you were inappropriate. So you do what you're supposed to. Again, more rote stuff because other people's needs matter more. 
Now, I'm not rejecting that outright. I'm just saying it's overly simplistic and it's very superficial. Our kids need deeper education. And doing the road stuff definitely does not teach you how to connect with somebody else. But if you're modeling clarification, you get to explain why you clarify. You can simply say, I'm not good at mind reading. So it would be disrespectful for me to think that I know what you're thinking and what you're feeling. And that is why I'm asking. Now, there are some people who seem to expect mind reading and they say, well, you should know me well enough by now. You should just know. You know anyone like this? I used to be married to somebody like that. Past tense, there's a reason for that. When you clarify, you emphasize that you know her well enough to care about and respect her, which is why you're not going to show her the disrespect of thinking that you know her so well that you can afford not to ask for clarification. Say, yes, I do know you well, honey, and I respect you deeply. That's why I don't want to show you the disrespect of reading your mind. I want to make sure that I hear you and what it is you really want. It's part of what brings us closer. Now, a father once asked me, how to teach his son to clarify when others are bored with him. And this is a problem I had too. Missing a lot of nonverbal cues. I would monologue for a long time and not notice when people are bored or ready to move on. So what I learned is to do a check-in. And this is what I recommend that he model for his son too by doing it himself. So you ask for clarification this way. You know, I've talked a lot about this. Would you like to hear more or would you like to change the subject? Because if you're talking to people that are afraid of clarifying and hurting your feelings or making you angry, they will suffer through a monologue or lie and make some excuse to get the heck away from you. But you want to set the stage for where they can switch the subject without anybody being hurt. And this clarifying question is very, very critical for doing that. And this is how I get clarification. I've made this habit now. And I know there are some things I like to ramble on and on about that people could, could frankly care less about but I still wanna maintain the connection with them. So what I do is invite them to change the subject. Now, I've given you a lot about clarification and that's why it's recorded so that you can really review it and boil it down. In fact, what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna boil it down into some simple bullet point ideas for you that you can take and begin to implement. Now, I'm going to give you two kind of mental columns here. One is the habits that sabotage clarification and the steps that enhance it. The first step that sabotages it, as we know, is assumption. You know, that belief that you can mind read other people. The second thing is projection. When you believe this person's thinking what I'm thinking, and since it makes sense in my head, I can assume that it makes sense in your head too. So it's assumption taken a little bit further. Then the third saboteur is self-importance. I shouldn't have to repeat myself. You should have been listening the first time. You don't allow for clarification when you believe that everything you say is so spectacular that people should always be on alert for the, the moment when your mouth opens. Not gonna happen. And the last saboteur to clarification is ego strength. It's your fear someone will be angry at you and it will hurt your feelings. So that fear sabotages it as well. Now here are the steps to make clarification a part of your relationship. You must believe that clarification is absolutely necessary in your relationships. Second, you must negotiate clarification as an essential part of your communication. Agree with others to do it. You know, when you say phrases like, oh, I'm so glad we clarified. I'm going to make sure we clarify from now on because I really want to make sure we understand each other. Is that something that's important to you too? And get them to buy into it. Also, you continue to model it so it becomes a habit in your relationship. You can also ask what I call 360 degree questions. Mm -hmm. The who, what, when, where, why, and how. That way you can make sure that you're getting the information you need to compensate for any nonverbal that you're missing. You know, oh, who is that again? What is it you want me to do? When do you need that by? Where are we meeting? 
oh, tell me why you need this so quickly. Oh, and how would you like me to do that? Okay? Now, the grand finale, the most important part of clarification. You agree to what action is going to be taken as a result of the communication. So I know this has been a long one, folks. I wanted to make sure it was comprehensive for you, and hopefully I've achieved that. So if you have any questions, as always, feel free to message me or type them below this video, and I will happily answer them. If you want to talk more privately, you know, private message, and if there are some people in your life, and I know there's probably a few, who could benefit from this, feel free to share. This has been Brian King, and I'll talk to you again soon.